Good evening and welcome to Slave Food Conversations, where two African-American physicians, Dr. Columbus Batiste, cardiologist, and Dr. Eric Walsh, emergency room physician with a doctorate in public health, explore the role of racism as a unique form of stress and the weaponization of food in the creation of health disparities in African-American communities, irrespective of income. They discovered that eating a whole food plant-based diet in urban communities is not only possible, but is the key to eliminating health disparities. This episode features a very caring, selfless, and proficient doctor, Dr. Pernessa Seal. Dr. Seal is an American immunologist, author, and interface public health activist. Dr. Seal is the CEO and founder of Balm and Gilead Inc., a religious-based organization that provides support to people with AIDS and their families, as well as working for prevention of HIV and AIDS. On this episode, these three esteemed physicians will discuss the intersection between faith and science. As always, the Slave Food team will forever appreciate your support. So please continue to spread the word about our mission and subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking the subscribe button. As And also, if you don't mind, why don't you go ahead and share this link on your Facebook pages so that your friends and family can know what you're doing and how you're trying to better yourself and the community. So sit back, relax, and if you haven't eaten, grab a healthy slack, snack and let your minds be fortified by this worthwhile conversation. Thanks, Danette. Dr. Seal, how are you? I am just fine. I am fine. Happy to be with the brothers this evening. All right. <laughs> Good to have you. Good to have you. Yes, yes, indeed. I I have to say I was extremely excited to get the response. You know, sometimes we fish, you know, maybe not literally, but we fish. We throw out little hooks and, and so forth to see whether or not whether or not we can get someone of your caliber to come on the show. And so I was so honored to have you agree with the work that you've done. I am looking forward to this conversation. I know Eric, my colleague, Dr. Walsh is chomping at the mm -hmm. bit, you know, with, with the work that you've done and the foundation that you've laid. So man, thank you. Welcome, welcome, well, welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. And I, I, must, I must say thank you for the introduction, but let me be very transparent. I started out as an immunologist 30, 40 years ago. Don't ask me about anything immunology today. I got a little idea in 1989, and that is that little idea is now a bomb in Gilead, mm. an international organization, and we started with HIV. But today our work is we want every church, every black church serving black people to have a health ministry because mm. we understand the influence of the church. And we know that not only our congregations, but our communities we want every church to be a beacon, a community hub for addressing health disparities or across the board. We oh. know that uh, the nation's African-American Brand Health Center, where we're focused on all harmers, we're focused on amyloidosis, we're focused mm -hmm. on diabetes. You name it, you know how, you know, we the black people, we got alarming rates of everything. <laughs> so we believe that our most influential institution, the church, must be at the forefront and our work is building their capacity to be just that. Mm. I, mm -hmm. I know, I know, I know. I Eric is going to take the lead, but I have to because we just had a close family member pass away from amyloidosis. Mm -hmm. So I love the fact that you mentioned about that. That's part of your mission to put that out there. And I know personally, I'm very curious about this little seed. You said this little seed was planted. This little idea that took mm -hmm. root uh, in, yeah. in your mind for this. So can you, you know, don't don't tease us like that. Tell us a little bit more about what happened. <laughs> Well, this little idea, you know, um, uh, in 89, I was uh, working as an immunologist. I had um, I had uh, left, I was working at um, Rockefeller University doing um, yeah. oral, um, mm -mm, uh, uh, malaria research. And then I was at Sloan Kettering doing cancer research. Uh, and then the AIDS epidemic hit New York City. And uh, I found myself in the methadone clinic. And then I went up to Harlem Hospital. And two days into that job, I was just amazed because the entire hospital was people who were actually dying then of HIV and AIDS. And nobody was coming. Where was the church? You know, I was, I'm from 
the low country where the church is the beginning of everything. You know, if you sick, mm -hmm. the, the, the pastor is coming. And if you die, oh, my God, within five minutes of the word going out, you know, uh, if the church is coming, the pastor is coming, everybody's coming. And in Harlem, um, what, what, I didn't understand that because everybody who left my little town in South Carolina went to Harlem. So I was just totally baffled. And um, I was really, um, I, I was, I was, this was two days on this new job at Harlem Hospital. And I was getting ready for, for work that morning. And I was just, you know, just desperately seeking answers on how is it that, you know, this entire hospital of people, brothers and sisters who are dying of HIV and nobody's coming. Uh, the pastors are not coming. The families are not coming. And in that moment, I had a little idea. And that little idea was the Harlem week of prayer for the healing of AIDS. And, uh, and that little idea, uh, I did not, I was new to Harlem. I did not know one pastor. I was not pastor. I had a bald head at the time. Um, and you know, <laughs> 33 years later, that little idea gave way to the bomb in Gilead in, in uh, 20 and 2000. We went out to, we worked in six African countries. Uh, we have a, we have an office in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, doing the same thing, building hmm. passive faith communities uh, to address HIV and now across the board. Um, so it was just a little idea. And, uh, and I always want to encourage everybody who has, who just have a little idea. You know, you don't, you don't have no money. Nobody knows what you're talking about. The idea don't make no sense. Forget all that. Just go do it anyway. If you believe the Lord is telling you to do something, just go do it. Everything will be all right. And that's my little idea. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Amen. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. So now you so you see so got inside involved in all that. And what's so interesting now is that as you kind of talked about this social isolation, you know, back during the AIDS epidemic, right? You talked about how you had this separation from interaction with like your community. This is really kind of what many have experienced during this COVID crisis, during mm -hmm. 2020, in a very similar type fashion. And 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 tell us about the impression and the role of the church, really, in in, in things like this this idea of COVID and and disseminating information and delivering information in a correct fashion. A absolutely, you know, and there's so many parallels between HIV and COVID uh, today, and the response of of the of the church. Um, and I'm happy to say that there are many churches across this country who have stepped up, who have been involved with uh, COVID testing, who have been involved, who are involved in COVID vaccines, the bomb in Gilead. We are very much involved with churches, particularly in the South and rural communities, because I have a heart for people who for the rural church. Um, it's it's uh, it's it's very it, it's very important that the role that the church is at the front just like it was important for the church to be um, uh, at the front leading the cause of HIV. Of course, we cannot just say all is well, because all is not well. You know, um, just like in HIV, you know, we had, you know, we had thousands of churches who were, who were doing the right thing, who were having the right conversation, but we also had pastors who were doing a lot of damage. And who damage that you know that is that's still impacting families today. You know, those mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers did not come to see their gay sons and gay daughters die and didn't have funerals because the the pastor who said, you know, homosexuality was a sin. So, you know, we cannot just say, oh, it was great, because it was not all great. And it's just like that today. You know, we have pastors who are standing up in pulpits who are saying the wrong thing today. You know, they're doing uh, great damage. I think the, the 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 greater challenge today is in 89, we did not have social media. You know, the church always has the bully pulpit, if you will. The pulpit is just loud. But today, you know, we, in addition to that that bully pulpit, we have social media and when you put erroneous information out on social media and you put in the name of Jesus behind it, it has a power that you really just don't understand. So we really have the, the, the greater work 
and the work of those who are pushing out facts and the, the work of those of us who are working to save lives, we must work even stronger and harder uh, to push against the tide of erroneous information and misinformation and just sending people uh, down the wrong the wrong path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's powerful. What 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 approaches have you all taken to kind of minister to the ministers as it relates to uh, educating them about COVID or about chronic disease, communicable and non-communicable diseases? Well, you know, that's that is the work of the bomb in Gilead. You know, uh, we we have a over these years, we've built a uh, a, a, a mechanism of uh, information. You know, I, I I'm. I, I always um, I think about those many, 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 many nights when we had to put, um, you know, uh, stamps on an envelope to send out. You know, when we were doing the mailing, you know, there was no email. There was, you know, you were taking bulk mail to the mail to the post office at two and three o'clock in the morning. Uh, and honestly, I really miss those times, you know, but we send out every Thursday. We send out information called um, a Sunday Morning Health Corner, and we send this out to over forty thousand churches, and that and that's picked up by denominations who then send it out to their churches and organizations who send it out to their churches, who is now a part of their Sunday morning program. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of uh, churches. Uh, we do churches. Um, that are focused on many different uh, areas. Like some churches are focused on Alzheimer's, you know, uh, our, our memory Sunday in June, uh, we are, we encourage every church to really focus on memory Sunday. In March, we are focusing on, you know, HIV. We're still doing the national week of prayer for the healing of AIDS. Um, and so we have, we have built a robust communication mechanism uh, that we are constantly um, sending out to our pastors and also to the laity. Um, and, and over these 33 years, we have relationships now where we learn from each other. My, my conference chair, the Healthy Churches 2030 conference, which we just completed, my chair is Bishop Horace Smith, uh, MD, uh, who is a, a apostolic faith uh, bishop out there in Chicago. Uh, and so he, he wears two hats. He's the bishop and he's the and he's the medical director. And, and we have many like that. Uh, but, you know, I now have is not just my voice. It's the voice of many who are now we are talking the same uh, the same language. Uh, and many pastors who are not the MD, they've kind of over these 33 years, we've kind of grown up in the movement, if you will, together. That's all right. Hmm. That's that's excellent. That's excellent. That's strong work. And so I, I imagine you've impacted thousands of lives, if not if not hundreds of thousands. You know, I really want to think so, but I, I'm really just trying to impact this third, this 17 year old male child who's just sitting in my house. You know, if I can <laughs> impact his life, it'll be all right. You know, um, I, I hear that. I mean, I hear that all the time about how many lives we've impacted, and I am humbled by that. It is. It is. It is. Um, uh, leadership is a humble is a humble thing. You know what I mean. Uh, yeah. People choose their leaders. They people choose who they follow. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I am humbled by those who listen, and I am humbled by those who who uh, who follow uh, my voice. And that's a, it's a great responsibility. It is a great responsibility. But uh, my charge to keep is the seventeen year old who lives in my house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> that's that is the work of the moment. Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> yes. I have a soon to be 17 year old and a 15 year old. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. How do you, how do you how do you deal with the so, so as we look at our society now, there's you know, it seems like there's less and less faith in it. Um, I come across more and more people who almost don't believe in anything. In fact, they have a name for them now called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Um, they have no religious belief whatsoever, and that's the fastest growing category in the United States. Um, so when you have a faith-based organization like you have, um, how do you, you know, how, how, how are you looking at the future where 
um, realistically, more and more, um, especially of our young people, they, they don't have that experience of the church that we have. Um, they're having a very different experience. And, um, you know, some of them, f- for good reasons, for bad reasons, you, you know, they kind of have a, a, a fear of the church, or sometimes a disdain for the church. How do you reach those young people? Especially since um, when we talk about social determinants of health and so forth, now is the time to reach them, kind of when they're young. I think that the church is definitely going through a a transition, uh, and COVID has definitely propelled uh, that 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 transition. Uh, I think that you know, for our work, we are um, constantly um, uh, bringing in the new the new pastors, if you will, you know, uh, because now we find we are you know uh, I'm old school, so I have those. The, the folks who have been with me for 33 years and, you know, we are we are 50 and up. Uh, and so I'm also engaging the younger pastors, the new leadership, you know, the, those who are coming into ministry out of the divinity school who are 22 and 23 and 25. Uh, and, and, and some of your your um, nuns, if you will, even though they will tell you they're nuns, they are they are on they are on YouTube listening to the 25 year old brother or sister on a Saturday night. You know what I mean? Uh, they, they don't see church like we do on Sunday morning. You know, they may, they may, catch, they may catch a YouTube or a podcast whenever they, they catch it. And they are not so much labeled as, you know, a Baptist or an AME or whatever. Um, and, and also they claim to be spiritual, aren't we all? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that, you know, the church is, you know, for, for, the, for my work as the CEO of the Bomb and Gilead, you know, and, and down the road with our, with our uh, uh, mission, our roadmap mission, is that we have to bring in new, new voices, voices who are, who, who, whose voice is being, who, who are captivating uh, the nuns, if you will. Uh, because when I, when, as I, I'm up the road a little bit now, and I remember, you know, I can tell some stories when once upon a time I would say I was a nun too, if you will, you know. Um, but we know that, you know, I know a little bit about the road ahead uh, that they do not know. Sometimes you are one thing and then you hit a big bump in the road and you just might find Jesus in that bump, if you will. Uh, and it might not happen until you 25, 30, 40 or 50. Don't know. But when that bump happens, you, you are anchored somewhere somewhere along the line. You're making a decision at this time in your life that I'm, go, I'm just going to be spiritual or I'm just going to be a nun. But somebody in your family, if you got black skin in America, somebody, your grandmama, somebody knows something about Jesus and the church. And if you sit still, you can remember a song she used to sing or he used to sing. And as, and as life pushes you down the road, you will remember those songs. And when you hit that bump in the road for yourself, you will, you will find yourself, you know? So I think that the transition uh, uh, is, is, is happening. Uh, and I think our churches are really going through a transformative time on, you know, the leadership is changing, you know, um, the, 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 the small church with, you know, 15, 20, people mm-hmm. in it that's all over 65 that's transition time you know so for my work my work is we are um strategically and focused on bringing in new leadership new leader the new leadership for the for the future I think that's huge yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. that's big yeah. yeah because you know i must say when i started out the the leadership the leadership 33 years ago was the new leadership. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now it's the old leadership, you know? So we've kind of grown up together, if you will. And now it's time we're moving on. And now the, the church is not going anywhere. You know, when you look at the three historical black churches, the AME, AME, Zion, CME, these are churches who were founded in the, in the late 1700s. They mm-hmm. have gone through some transition. You know, uh, Harriet Tudman was a member of, you know, the AME Zion and Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth, they have gone through transition. And I believe that they're going to weather the storm through this transition as well. 
Amen. Well, I think just adding to it, I mean, you're you're transforming the way in which you deliver health. And I, we'll touch on that a bit later about how that journey was of introducing health inside of the churches where maybe that has or has not always been historically the, the emphasis. But, you know, I mean, you think about it when you're reaching people who are in their greatest need and you spoke about really you saw that there was a need when you were on that AIDS ward. You saw a need that there was that they were calling out for something and you sought to provide that in a similar fashion. You're seeking to provide relief from chronic disease, from uh, uh, communicable diseases that's there. I think that's what really binds people to understand that you're putting love into action. Right. And they, they understand that there's a level of care and concern that that has depth to it and not just spoken words. So I think there, there's power that's there. You know, um, folks always, you know, will always say, well, how how did you how did you bring HIV into the church? You know, and, and certainly I was not the first one who tried to get the churches to talk about HIV. I was not the first one. I may have, I might have been among the first to be successful at it. But you know, the idea was a Harlem week of prayer for the healing of AIDS. That's the language of the church. You know, that's cultural competence, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, I didn't go in with a condom and a banana. I went in with prayer and healing, but it was an educational program. So through the lens of prayer and healing, we took in HIV education. And I didn't go in with my agenda to tell the pastor how to deal with HIV. I gave him, the, I gave him or her the facts and, and said, Pastor, I, we, would you please, just on this Sunday, would you please offer a prayer for HIV? Well, what happened? Pastor said yes. So on that Sunday, he offered a prayer for HIV. Well, guess what? When the pastor said we pray for HIV, the, 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 the gates opened up. People then came up and said, oh, pastor, thank you. Thank you for the prayer because I have HIV. Pastor, thank you for the prayer because my son died. Pastor, thank you for the prayer because my daughter is sick. Pastor had no clue how much HIV was in his congregation. Then that little brochure I left on his desk had a whole new meaning now because now he has shifted because he's like, oh my God, I had no idea how much HIV is here because people want to tell their pastor what's going on in their life. Mm. You know, that's the role of pastor to be the shepherd. So, you know, it's, it's really about when we're working with the church, it's really about cultural competence. You know, it's not, you know, give them something they can do. Give them something they can use. Don't, don't send something in there that you know is not going to sit well, because you're right. They're going to throw it back out. You know, but if you go in with something that is culturally affirmative for the audience that you want, I guarantee you, you'll be successful. Mm, right. Love that. Love it. Love it. Love it. So so when you were kind of tackling the church and especially, you know, you mentioned even moving a little bit beyond AIDS and, and communicable diseases to non-communicable diseases, which are rampant. And you allude to this with diabetes and heart disease. I see heart disease on a regular basis in my, in my practice. Um, and you you you're touching on all those things. How do you juxtapose and deal with and address one of the challenges across every African-American church, which is the food, <laughs> right? The potlucks, right? Baby, the gospel bird, honey. You know, I was a vegetarian for eight years prior to starting the Harlem Week of Prayer of the Healing of AIDS. And mm. when I started, I never went back to red meat. I never went back to red meat. But when I started working with these churches on a 365 days regular, Oh, my God, I just went back to the gospel bird, the chicken. Uh, and I think that over these years, we have seen many churches, many churches who have, you know, turned on the light. You, they have, excuse me, they have turned on the light with what they're feeding their people. Unfortunately, most times it happens when the pastor has to address a chronic, a chronic illness when the pastor's had a heart attack, 
when the pastor's dealing with prostate cancer or whatever, or the first lady, uh, and those experiences shift the pastor and therefore it shifts the congregation because a healthy church begins with a healthy pastor, if you will, you know? Um, so, but I, but I think that there's a lot of work still to be done, especially, uh, in the South, there is still a lot of work to be done, you know? So when I go into when I'm in, and I'm just saying that this, that's not just in the South, but we yeah. see a prevalence of it that, you know, it's, it's still hard to get when you go into, you know, uh, a church in Mississippi, uh, you still see the fried chicken and the mac and cheese and, and, the, and the usual, Whereas maybe up north, you may still see fried chicken, but you're going to see some baked chicken next to it. Uh, but then in other settings, you don't see no more fried chicken. It's all baked, you know, and you see a salad, you know. But so yeah, I think we are, we have, I, I, over these three decades, have not thoroughly seen movement shift. No, but definitely movement in the right direction. Mm -hmm. That's and true. as you get as you get more pastors shifting, those influential pastors take that to the to the younger pastor, to the assistant pastor, who will lead further down the road. You know, so it's a it's a word of mouth. You know, the when you when they start, then you see it moving forward. Yeah, no, I, no, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the that's one of the things. It's it's always interesting to me. I love like the stories. I've taken care of some pastors. And they'll tell, me, they'll tell me about their transformation when they undergo a Daniel fast. Mm -hmm. They'll tell me about the, the the congregation, about how their their mind becomes clear and how their their bodies and everything else. And so the role of nutrition. And so I think it's I think it's powerful. I think one of the things as I was preparing for you to come on today that you made a, you alluded to in, in other conversations and talks is about some of your efforts to utilize the church grounds. Or something yeah. different than what they're put there yeah. they're currently using why don't yeah. you speak to that like a little bit i don't want to steal the thunder okay well you know thank you for that and i must say that um uh one of my churches you know we love the daniel fast <laughs> we have to also help them to not have a fried fish to break the fast <laughs> transitional <laughs> fast what the planning is for the breaking of the fast so <laughs> we're gonna do this daniel fast and then on on good friday we're going to break down your fast with a fish fry. Um, can we rethink that? <laughs> so. Well, you know, rethinking it may start with changing the name from Daniel Fast to Daniel Feast because you're not hungry when you're eating well on that Daniel Fast, right? You, <laughs> so you're going to just continue. I, I, I think I think we I think we still have some work to do on the end and on the on the final scenario of that of that Daniel Fast, but um. We are the bomb in Gilead. We launched the African American Community Garden Church, African American Church Community mm -hmm. Garden Project, uh, and we launched it uh, this year uh, in South Carolina, um, and uh, and we've had great success. And you know, our partner is the Black Church Food Network uh, in this partnership, and I was just mm -hmm. blown away by the work that they did and mm -hmm. partnered with them to bring in our churches into this into this conversation uh and uh, because i'm blessed to own some land in south carolina in my little town mm -hmm. i said okay i'm going to i pay taxes on the land yes i'm going to clear off some land and mm -hmm. let the community use this as a garden mm -hmm. and bring the community back together again right. um and you know it worked you know it worked and we now have 17 churches all over south carolina who started planting a garden and wow. i think that's so important because in the south unlike unlike the urban church exactly the rural churches in the south they got land you know mm -hmm. and all they mm -hmm. plant down back there is dead folk and you know let's be start <laughs> planting some some broccoli and some collard yeah. cheese and some squash and and uh it, it was just you know and we had um our bishops to come out and be a part of the of the, of the, of the seeds you know planting the seeds and mm -hmm. then we came back and did an event during the harvest and you know and had a barbecue come on now because you got to keep it in culture 
you know, uh, had a had a barbecue uh, in the late August. So people came and again, we gave them plastic bags and they went in the garden, picked okra and peas. And, you know, I mean, I know we, we can do this thing, but we have to keep it in black culture who we are. Absolutely. And I think as we move, as we move our health agenda, Mm-hmm. You know, we have to be conscious that, that how, how we're going to bring more people in by moving it with what we know who we are, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and and I'm seeing I'm seeing the success of that. So for those who are listening, you know, go to Bomb and Gilead and go to our videos and see that garden and get in touch with us. If you want to start a garden, uh, we are just excited. Uh, and we now the folks are they are um, <laughs> they are. <coughs> Excuse me. They are um are fertilizing the garden and getting ready for the springtime. I'm gonna clear off mm-hmm. more land because we're gonna do a uh, a greenhouse next mm-hmm. year alongside. You know, it's just great to see the community um, right. come out and encourage the children. Yes. You know, I mean, to, we actually, you know, again said bring your children out here and help put them in the dirt. You know what I mean? Put them in the dirt. So yes. it's just been exciting, just absolutely exciting. I love, love, love that. You know, there is uh, someone called the Gangster Gardener. I believe that's his name mm-hmm. out in LA, and Ron Finley. I don't know if you've ever heard him or looked at his YouTube and so forth. And he always kind of says inside of his his TED Talk, famous TED Talk, is that children will eat what children grow. <laughs> if, you, if, if they're only eating burgers and fries and never learning how to pick strawberries and, and eat things of, of the earth, they won't eat that. And so I think that's so powerful what you're you're allowing them to really engage in to kind of counteract the idea of these food swamps and food deserts, you know, and 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 to your point, that's been Eric and I, that's been our mission mm-hmm. really along this project is to let people know that our culture is steeped in yeah, foods yeah. that have healing power. That's Our culture is steeped in gardening of the earth and stemming all the way back to West Africa and the foods that are there. You know, it's not our culture for this stuff that was falsely put in front of us. And so we have to really embrace it as a whole. That's so I, I love, love, love that. I loved it when I heard it before and I love it even more with hearing you well, say and it. And you know, another reason about the success is that it, it the garden reaches everybody. So the seniors are excited about the garden, you know, because Mm -hmm. they haven't had a garden since mom and them, you know, or Mm -hmm. they can't get out and do the garden as they wanted to. So now that the church is doing the garden, Mm -hmm. it gives them, you know, it encourages them. I can go out here, bring my grandkids with me to help me plant some seeds. So it becomes an intergenerational conversation, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. so much of our gardens especially way out in the rural community they are they are happening because of the seniors mm-hmm. you know uh, because the seniors are excited to get out there and plant some squash uh and some okra and you know because our kids we, uh, okra what is an okra <laughs> <laughs> come on now but you, know, you know you know and i i hate i hate kind of just stealing the thunder so Eric, jump in here Jeanette, jump in here i can't help myself because i'm just excited as always with with guests like Dr. Seal. And so, you know, when I hear you mention about the seniors and that interaction between our more senior uh, generation and the younger generation, it brings to mind this idea and concept brought forth by Dan Buettner in the Blue Zones, the most Mm -hmm. long-lived areas around the world where that Mm -hmm. Venn diagram has the intersection of people who continue to have a purpose in life. That's right. They have a belief system. They have a diet that is strong and rich and steeped and plant-based, but they have a purpose, Mm -hmm. uplifting women, but also the fact that our seniors are not cast off, that they still play a role in engagement that's there. And one of the things that we Mm -hmm. sought out as we started our journey is we love to see black blue zones. Mm -hmm. We love to show proof and evidence that there can indeed be long lived populations of people of African descent across the United States, not whose whose lives are truncated (laughs) based on chronic disease, based on situations and circumstances. So I just had to throw that in because I was, I was hearing this and it was just speaking. And we have to be intentional, you know, intentional is everything about, you know, about engaging our seniors, you know, Mm -hmm. and not throwing them away, you know, Um, and and it's, it's intentional because Mm -hmm. in our energy is always focused on, you know, the younger and I, I, my, my staff, you mm-hmm. know, I'm the, I'm the I'm the senior of the staff these days. You know? 
And uh, some days I just, you know, I'm like, what's wrong with these young people? You know, I, I wish I was back in New York when everybody was the same age, you know? Right. Um, but it's 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 the yin and the yang because right. my role is to teach the next exactly. generation. My role is to bring them in and teach them my experience, but also to listen. Yes, the bomb in Gilead is going to live beyond me only if I listen to the next leadership of the bomb in Gilead. Absolutely. You know, so you know, so we have to be in, and and I I say that to say. I have to, uh, as whereas well I am intentional mm -hmm. about every program, I am intentional about the seniors. Yes. They make me intentional about young people. Right. So therefore, it's a balance, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because, and, and I think that for, for those of us who have organizations, you know, we have to find that balance that, you know, we're not over mm -hmm. here and not over there, but we have to bring in, we have to support our seniors because they have information and most of the chronic diseases that we are talking about, uh, as well as we have to bring in the next generation of leadership as well. And you mentioned that a little bit earlier on on the program in terms of you know how that how we get that inter intersectionality between the young and the old and and like we grew up, when we grew up like you said the church was everything everything that you did was around the church you know the thirteenth Sunday or Sabbath or whatever you had to recite those those poems and or you had to you know learn those songs or you had to learn those scriptures and things of that nature and so they we were and at, at that instance when we were growing up we were forced to be involved. Involved. Like we didn't have an option of not going to church or not doing what, you know, what they said you needed to do. If they said you right. need to learn this poem, you learned the poem, you got up and said the poem. Right. But that's how the leadership was built, you know, in terms of the younger people now who are out and have that level of comfort, you know, getting in front of a, in front of a church, you build that confidence in terms oh. of your ability to speak, in terms of your ability to communicate. And so, you know, with the whole um, pandemic and everyone kind of being moved out of that setting where you do have the combination of the young and the old together, learning from each other, the isolation part does come in and you are losing some of that ability to, to share and to, to grow and support and teach each other. So it seems like you found a way to, you know, to get around that. So do you do a lot of, you know, webinars or are you back in the churches with most of your programs? We are, we are, um, uh, we are getting ready to get on the road again, face to face. Okay. But in this, we just completed our, you know, our virtual. We did a virtual conference in, in, mm -hmm. uh, in twenty, and we just did our second virtual. And both of them were very success successful. And okay. I don't think I want to take that conference back face to face. It's gonna stay virtual, you know. Right. Um, and I think that again, back to the transition. Mm -hmm. I'm finding that there are a lot of elders who don't have no intention of going back to church on Sunday. Right. You know, and, and young and younger people too. Young, younger people too. But I'm <laughs> amazed. I am amazed that my, you know, my 60, 70, 80 year old friends, they are like, girl, I'm not getting ready to go back to putting them stockings and hat on on Sunday morning. I am really enjoying sit, sit, sitting up in my bed and listening to these six pastors I listen to every Sunday. Exactly. Exactly. I have no clue that COVID has is really taking us into directions that we mm -hmm. did not think we did not no. expect. Yeah. No. You know? So, you know, you for 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 the for pastors, you know, again, we are transitioning. How are we going to keep the the seniors who mm -hmm. now don't want to come back to church, COVID right. or not COVID, they right. are happy being home. They have found uh their fellowship online. They have people mm -hmm. who come over. Sometimes mm -hmm. some of them have people who come over and watch the YouTube with them. Yes, <laughs> um, yes. They love singing their songs by themselves on Sunday. You know, um, it's we're just in a transition that mm -hmm. we just don't know from here. COVID yes. has accelerated uh, our 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 transition. But for the bombing okay. period, our work with our virtual mm -hmm. again, I make sure that we have the old school. And the new, okay, you know, representation uh, on on it's, it's okay. A, it's a health, it's a public health conference where public mm -hmm. health and faith come together. But okay. we start with praise and worship in the morning. Okay, you know, and uh, you know, I'm gonna always have you know uh, old school praise and worship. 
mm-hmm. and I'm gonna have young school praise and worship. <laughs> now, I know the young, I don't understand none of that young school <laughs> praise and worship. I don't understand what they're singing about. You know, it, it, I just don't get it. So I know I have to bring some, you know, going up a yonder, mm-hmm, you know, so, <laughs> you know, I have to bring some of that in because that's what this group know. And right. then I leave it to my younger generation to bring to in, bring in the other, you know, the, okay, the, the 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 um the worship team, mm-hmm. you know, five of them. They got on jeans. They got holes in their jeans. Everybody got a mic. There's flashing lights behind them. I have no <laughs> clue what they're saying, you know. But somebody does, right? But they do. But they right, do, right. and that's what right. matters. They do, right. and 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 I think we have to again. The word is intentional. We right. have to intentionally bring balance to the conversation as we are transitioning into what we where we're going. And going back to the work that you guys did with AIDS, because I remember, you know, when when AIDS first came out, it was the kiss of death. You had AIDS, you were dying, right? People right. stopped saying it's as serious as cancer. It became as you're as serious as AIDS, you know, and things of that nature. But as a result of medications and other things, you know, the life, the prognosis for someone with AIDS or AIDS or HIV is not death. So have you seen some of the successes that you guys um, were able to implement and um, with with your approach to to AIDS and HIV? And, and have you looked at how some of those could be applied to the COVID? Well, absolutely. I think all of it can be applied to COVID. Uh, as I as I as I shared uh, earlier about the role of the church and being at the front line, mm-hmm. I think uh, another another area is stigma. Okay. You know, uh, the stigma of, of HIV killed a mm-hmm. lot of people, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Didn't talk about it. The uh, silence. You know, the silence killed. Right. Exactly. And, mm-hmm. and let's be clear, HIV is still a, a epidemic mm-hmm. in the black community. You okay. know, one in every one in every two black gay men have HIV and one mm-hmm. in every 19 women, black women have HIV. So okay. we, we don't hear it just because we don't mm-hmm. talk about it. This doesn't mean it's not there. It. Right. Does that mean the epidemic in HIV epidemic in our community is still rampant? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. um, but that's another conversation uh, in terms of, uh, you know, when, 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 when government funding dropped, mm. we dropped. Okay. You know? Um, and I think that is that is one of the challenges we face with um with with uh um health programs in the church okay that unless we have the leadership Mm. the leadership the commitment of the leadership that makes health ministry a part of the church's budget yes then we are susceptible that okay we're doing this today because we somebody because the health department gave us five thousand dollars or really i gave us some money to do this so Mm -hmm. it's going to always be a hit and miss until the leadership makes a commitment that health ministry and addressing health disparities in our congregation, our community mm-hmm. is going to be, you know, sustained. That's when we have crossed over. So it becomes it becomes a priority and it's a line item on yeah. that tithing envelope. Right. That's exactly right, because where mm-hmm. you your commitment is where you put your money. Exactly. You know, so when the church budget. Mm-hmm now has a budget a line item for health ministries Mm -hmm. you know and it may not be it may not be a line item on the envelope Mm -hmm. but because when you put your offering in the pastor and the boat the trustees they tell they say where it goes but you know your your budget that the church people don't see you know how much you are going to give that health ministry and what they're going to do that Mm -hmm. for their doing their planning so a part of our work is to when we're talking about uh building the capacity of health ministries it's not just the education compete component okay. it's okay. also uh empowering the leadership that we're talking about a sustainability you know okay. it's just like you know I, I give the example of a youth ministry mm-hmm. every black church got a youth ministry mm-hmm. why because mm-hmm. once upon a time it was important that black folks n- knew how to read and write. Mm-hmm. You know, coming when Tus when and Booker T. Washington, them, all of them, you know what I mean? We were start, we were starting colleges and mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. education was key. And right. we wanted to make sure that black 
young people and adults knew, knew how to read and write and education was our focus. Okay. Therefore, black all black churches got a youth ministry. Today, mm -hmm. you may have a church with no youth in the church, but they but still have <laughs> a youth right. ministry. Right. My goal is, my life's work is, is that every black church will have a health ministry that mm -hmm. is sustained beyond generations, just yes. like the youth ministry. Okay. Just like the youth ministry. Mm -hmm. That is my personal goal and the goal of the bomb in Gilead. That's wonderful. And for you, what is what when you say health ministry? So what does it structurally, functionally, um, what does it look like? So I heard you say education, and obviously you empower the leadership for a lot of churches. I think they, the, it's the nuts and bolts. Of health ministry that's really challenging for them. Mm. Not really, you know. <laughs> it, 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 you know the you know the women's ministry. Mm -hmm. You know the men's mm -hmm. the men's ministry. The black church we we got ministries. We got the transportation ministry. We got the sick and shut in ministry. We got the you, you name it. We got it, and it's called mm -hmm. what ministry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the health ministry. The mm -hmm. health ministry focuses on what let's make sure that we give us some health information to the congregation. Okay. Right? It can mm -hmm. be not that simple. It doesn't have to be elaborate because we have churches who do the simple thing like we're going to give up this information, which is why the bomb in Gilead, we send them Sunday morning health corner every Thursday. So they okay. have something health to give their congregation every mm -hmm. Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. Some churches, what they do, they do one health fair. Mm -hmm. or in the summertime some churches like one of my churches every second sunday there's a doctor who gets up before the pastor preaches and they have a health moment every second sunday mm -hmm. some churches they have to build the big telethron and something mm -hmm. about health comes up every sunday on the board so right. you can find something to do mm -hmm. around health in mm -hmm. that sphere. the people who are responsible for that is the what the health ministry. ministries department, right? That's the health ministry. The same mm -hmm. with the transportation. Those are the folks who go <laughs> and pick up the sick and the shut in on Sunday. The right. The right. Ministry, ministry, you know, they're the part of the ones who do it. That, well, you know, you got the kitchen ministry. Don't forget the kitchen ministry. Mm -hmm. so, right. You know, yeah. you and we, know we, need, we need to blend that kitchen ministry with the health ministry, is what that's we need exactly to do. Right. We, got, we right. got to combine those two. That's exactly, and you know what? We also combine the health ministry with the men's ministry because okay. men have what? Prostate mm -hmm. cancer. Right, health issues, And the right. women's ministry have breast cancer. So right. the, the health ministry really encompasses mm -hmm. all of the ministries. But, you know, you have to have someone to help shape that, you know? Right. So yeah, it's, um, you know, 33 years there's movement, you know, mm -hmm. and everybody's moving at their pace. Right. But movement yeah. really is, is 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 dependent upon the commitment of the leadership yeah. because a healthy church begins what with a healthy, healthy pastor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's a mental that's a mental health pastor. Now I'm not talking about actual physical. We hope that, but you know, usually, as you know, Dr. Baptiste, they've had some something has uh the Holy Ghost gotten to them when they were seeing you in your office. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Love or fear gets the people in, inspired, right? It's that's right. Two, that's right. exactly right. Mm -hmm. that, that's wonderful. You know, as, as I listen to you kind of talk and, and all the tremendous work that you've done, of course, I can't help myself. My wife always says, I always got an opinion about everything and have an idea <laughs> about everything. I, I, I mean, I think one thing, and this is something we've been striving to develop and work on, but really it's for these churches, if they could even commit to once a quarter, I, I would like to say once a month, and but maybe it's too onerous that they choose to have a healthy meal where where yeah. there is a video that gives a description of how this is impacting their body, of how it's empowering their body, how it's transforming. Right. When we look at the burden of disease of of coronary disease in hypertension in the African-American community <laughs> that ravages us. Diabetes. We're just exiting Diabetes Awareness Month and how it rips through families and just uh, it shortens health span, uh, excuse me, lifespan and health span combined. Mm -hmm. There's so much power in what we can do on top of the screenings, on top of the information, but it's almost like transforming it from word into action That's right. inside That's right. that moment. 
And that's what yeah. it sounds like you're striving to with the garden and everything else. So, so, so very powerful. We just and I would to, say we have to keep working at it. Absolutely, it's just a work in progress. It is one of, one of the most important things uh, about what you know everything we're talking about is the the tangible power that comes from the gardens. Mm -hmm. And you know when we go to churches and I talk to churches, I say if there's a single thing you could do is start a garden and and or uh, bring in a farmers market into your parking lot every so often to make sure that your community and your and your church members have access to. Um, low cost uh, variety of plant foods because in the urban setting, a lot of our churches don't have very good access to these things. Um, the other thing, I, you know, when I go into churches, I like to do is show them biblically um, some of the principles from scripture. Like we talked about a Daniel fast, you go to Dan uh, Genesis one twenty seven. There are Bible passages that really show what God expects from us around health. That our body is literally His temple, and when you change the way you see it like that. Um, oftentimes that's what it takes to help move people. A lot of our members with diabetes have never heard that you can reverse diabetes. Mm -hmm. They don't know that diabetes is a reversible disease. Um, and, you know, there's a biblical way to actually present that so that it really is palatable and so that it is in, it is in synergy with their spiritual walk. And that's, to me, that's the secret to health ministry and church. Health ministry and church makes the physical health and the spiritual health work together to really create a stronger individual and therefore a stronger congregation. Absolutely. I could not agree with you. Uh, absolutely. One of the, one of the sessions we had at our conference um, two weeks ago was uh, how does my um, managing, managing my, my ha managing my diabetes with my faith, something mm. like that. I don't think I'm, I don't think I have it right, but um, it was, how does my faith help me manage my diabetes? You know, uh, and it was it was it was very it was very very powerful. You know, and mm -hmm. we had we had uh, PhD doctors and and people with uh, we had an NFL player wh whoever you know just normal folk um, uh, diabetes uh, advocates um, mm -hmm. who were talking about how their faith helped them. And I think that we have to constantly um, uh, teach how we cook differently. You mm -hmm. know, because. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you know, culture with black folks, it's it's serious. You know, um, I remember many, many years ago, I decided that I was because I I'm always asked to make the mac and cheese. That's my thing. Aunt P's mac and cheese. So we always we were going at that time we were going to Greeleyville, South Carolina for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And Aunt P is bringing the mac and cheese because this is my mom and them started. We have to all come together for Thanksgiving, you know. Well, so, that says something. That means you must really know how to cook. That they didn't ask you to bring the paper plates or the drink. So no, no <laughs> mac and cheese is I, serious. I have, I have to bring the mac and cheese and the turkey and the dressing. Okay? Oh man, you okay? I'm bowing because you. And, you and really my mac and cheese is gone. Okay, but this year <laughs> I decided I was going to do the mac and cheese, but not so much cheese, not so much mac, if you will. And I was not going to use, you know, four or five sticks of butter. And I was not going to use all that cheese. And I was not going to do all that. I'm going to I'm going to do a healthy pan of mac and cheese in Greeleyville, South Carolina. What happened to that mac and cheese? Tell me what happened to it. It stayed there. Nobody ate it. That's exactly right. <laughs> well, how did you make it healthy? What did you do to make it healthy? <laughs> she didn't. She she didn't use as much butter or cheese. You, right. That's it. it? It, it, that's all. That, that's it. What else? You know, I could not. I'm. I def. I definitely wasn't gonna uh, bring. Uh, make it with no vegan macaroni. I. I couldn't get. I couldn't get that far with them. The best I could do as a step one was to limit the ingredients. And they didn't even think you had made it, right? They I, said I didn't get to phase two. I didn't get to phase two. So, <laughs> my, but and my, but my my point is is mm -hmm. that. We have to always root our thinking on how we bring things to our church folk. Right. Culturally. You know, right. Culturally. You know, mm -hmm. and we have to, I don't know the last time I made collard greens with meat in it. You right. know, my, right. my collard greens don't have any meat, it's made with olive oil. Yes. And, and my cousins don't eat my collard greens. Mm -hmm. You can almost them. get away with the collard greens. It's the mac and cheese. Yeah, it's hard. They, don't, they don't. They don't. It don't. It don't taste right. To my, <laughs> my cousins. Now they have gone from pork to turkey. Okay. okay. So it's a gradual progress. But the fact that I'm eating collard greens with no meat. 
Oh no, it did. Mm -mm, mm -mm. So mm. I'm saying that you know sometimes we, the public health advocates, we want to see change immediate. Mm -hmm. And you need baby steps, right? This, this change doesn't happen with us culturally yeah. overnight. It just right. does not happen overnight. And I've seen some changes, but it takes a minute. It takes a minute. It, it definitely doesn't. It definitely doesn't happen overnight if we don't lay the foundation. I was just listening to mm -hmm. the book I'm reading now. Um, the, the physician who's talking about behavior change talks about the fact that we actually it, what paid what we find in the in the doctor's offices. Patients will change their behavior when we give them a good reason as to why. Mm -hmm. And that takes time. And that's the, a big role of health ministry is to lay down in the church all of the whys. Again, because a lot of people in America, and it's not just black people, a lot of poor white people, Latino people, uh, Native Americans, they have never made the connection between what they eat and the diseases they walk around with. And Eric, uh, I'll and go one step is, further in that it's, it's, it's got to be the why and it's got to be the how. Mm -hmm. Well, no, but without the why, the how is you're not even gonna get it never to that. happens to her and, point. And, and the consistent message from the pulpit. Yes, mm -hmm. but the, the why is important because the again, a lot of people don't think one one piece of you know buttered up macaroni and cheese is gonna do them any harm. So it, it doesn't matter if you teach them how to make it healthy. What matters is that they have not come to the belief that that thing is gonna harm them. Just like it takes thousands of cigarettes before you get the damage from a cigarette which is why for so long in America, everybody smoked and thought nothing was wrong with it. There's a lot of work to do, especially in our community, because food is more than just nutrition in our community. That's it right. is fellowship. It is emotional. Right. It is uh, it, it averts trauma. It's a stress reducer. Uh, food is the most overused um, anti-anxiety medicine and exercise mm -hmm. is the most underused antidepressant. And our right. people have to learn those lessons the hard way sometimes, but we've got to re really, that's the work of the health ministries to, to try and show, share that with our people. Absolutely. It absolutely is. It's comfort. You know, mm -hmm. today I said, mm, I would, I really need to go home and buy, make me a pot of grits. I haven't made grits in months, but I was thinking about my mama. Right. <laughs> There's an emotional and physical way. Yeah. It wasn't until I was sitting at the table eating the grits that I realized why I was eating mm -hmm. that grits. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was eating that grits and I, and I said to the 17 year old, um, can you bring me a, just a little bit of butter? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I just want a little bit of butter with the grits. Right. And it, it reminded you of her. I asked for the butter. Mm -hmm. I realized, oh, this is about me. I've been thinking about mama. Mm -hmm. and you, and so all of that, the ancestral stuff, all mm -hmm. of that is it goes into our culture and the shift that we have to work through to get mm -hmm. our people healthy. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, absolutely. In absolutely. those moments, it is, you know, sometimes you, you reach for that. And, and I know like sometimes they say it's the drug of choice. Right. And sometimes right. that food is that drug of choice. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Yeah. No, it's it's I, I definitely feel exactly what you're saying. When I think reflect on my dad, I think about those things that weren't the healthiest that we would have. And I and mm. and it reminds me. It triggers a memory. And so even if whether or not I pass the anniversary of his death or his birthday and I pass the grocery aisle, my mind goes immediately to like those things. I'm drawn towards them, mm -hmm. you know, and it takes really an effort to for me not to. Right. And, and right. what you bring up is an right. important thing, a important concept, a bridge is understanding that. Why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? Why am I having this moment? Let mm -hmm. me stop and have awareness. Right. Why I'm craving this. Yeah. Right. Yes. And here's the thing, going back to the very be uh, point in our conversation before we talked about spirituality, prayer, meditation, whatever the belief system is, is that studies have shown these things strengthen the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. they, they strengthen it and they give you the fortitude in part that you're able to to make these decisions and stop and 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 think where am I laying my resources? Right, right? because I'm stressed. Right, what demands of life. Exactly. And, so, exactly. And, and, I, and, I, and I would go back to Daniel. You know, when Daniel was 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 being um, pressured to eat the mm -hmm. king's meat and to drink his wine, mm -hmm. Daniel said to the the king to the head of the eunuchs, he said, "I, I don't want to defile myself with this food." That's powerful. It ties in the spiritual. And there's a great saying I learned when I was doing addiction medicine at Loma Linda University Medical Center at the Veterans Hospital. One of the veterans taught me this. They said, God made the human heart so big that only he can fill it. 
Mm-hmm. And he said, if you try and fill the God-sized hole in your heart with anything but God, you'll become addicted to it. It will ruin mm-hmm. your life. It will take mm-hmm. you over. And that's a profound statement because if if the pain that we've suffered caused us to turn to food to ease the pain rather than turning to our Savior, then we, we're going we're gonna to be in a cycle that's going to cause us trouble. And I think all as Black people, especially with all the pain we suffer, mm-hmm. that is a difficult and challenging thing. And it's also why, to your point, um, you know, we are, for the most part, we still are so attached to the church because there's something powerful and, 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 and visceral about the power of the blood of the lamb, about the, what Christ did for us. And that brings us back all the time. And it's, it's why we're there. And that's why um, we've got to always remember, he, God made the human heart so big, only he can fill it. That's right. That's right. It's, um, it, you know, it's, it, it's. It's a daunting task. Our work is it's 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 really it's really daunting. And uh, at the end of the day, I think we we are working uh, with the pew and we're working with the pulpit. You know, yep. um, mm-hmm. because I you know I am the I am the 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 leader. Uh, I'm the elder now in the family, and mm-hmm. you know, I, and I'm just go, you know I, I'm very it's very easy for me to share my struggles. Um, you know, we're getting ready to have a big. Memorial Day gathering. We haven't had a gathering in about five years. And mm. we are very connected to my mama and auntie and them. You know what I mean? When we get together, you know, we're spending most of our time talking about them and what they cooked and, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? I had, um, you know, that corn pudding. And the conversation <laughs> is when we get to, I, I actually taped it one time. We sat and we spoke for hours around. We went through everybody who was passed over to heaven. And it was all about what they cooked and how they cooked it and what we remembered about it. And so as we are planning this big thing later on in the next year, it's I'm struggling with, I, can't, I, I cannot bring up, we, we're not going to roast a pig this year. <laughs> See, you all laugh, but that's real. Yeah, I know. I know. And I think that we have to understand that we can talk all this lofty stuff, yeah. but the shift has got to come when we recognize the reality of, of the struggle of our culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and, and somebody got to make the shift that we are not going to roast a pig this year and pray that people don't spend all day talking about where to pig. <laughs> <laughs> they remember why they're there, right? They're going to put in place of the pig. You know, I mean, this is the shift that leadership, that mm-hmm. leadership has to make. Whether mm-hmm. you're leading a congregation, whether you're leading a family, whatever, right. whether you're leading an organization, mm-hmm. the shift has to happen with the leadership that mm-hmm. no, we're not going to do a pig this year. We're mm-hmm. just going to do chicken and fish and some crabs. <laughs> and, and hope that people don't act out because they don't have a pig to roast. Because they're not getting what they're used to, because, right? Because Uncle Sonny roasts the pig every time. Uncle Sonny's in heaven now, and we're not on Uncle Sonny if we don't roast a pig, right? Because you're gonna be in there with him, you know, if you keep eating. Does anybody right. understand what I'm talking about? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's the work. That's the work of how we have to think to shift the paradigm yeah. mm-hmm. on the community, on our families, on our communities, right. on our congregations. Right. You right. know, it's a shift in what we've always done and who is going to take the mantle to make the shift. Right. If the leadership doesn't shift it, it will not ever happen. Yeah. So true. It's been good talking to you all. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it has been. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like we're around the sofa, around the dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> having a conversation, planning out the future. Yes, uh, I've, been, I've enjoyed this tremendously. And you have reinstilled hope in what the work that you're doing mm-hmm. um, in branching out to these communities and to churches, because yeah. as you mentioned, it's been said repeatedly, they are the cornerstone historically and currently inside yeah. of our communities. And so addressing them, essentially you're going right to the, the snake's head and really trying to make a change. Yeah. And I'm so appreciative of that. So well, I would love to invite you all to my podcast, Dr. P. Every Thursday is Dr. P. on the pod. And all right. I'm gonna make I'm gonna make sure that 
my administrator contact uh, each of you individually over the next the next 52 weeks uh, that you come and be my guest on the podcast mm-hmm. so we can continue this conversation because we uh, we have frank conversation just like this uh, <laughs> with the community about we're going to be and when we get down to May, we're going to be talking about that pig. We're going to do instead. So I really appreciate it. And thank you for the invitation. And I look forward to continuing the dialogue. All right. We appreciate that. Any final words, Dr. Walsh, as we sign off? Well, I just, I think I want to reiterate something that was said initially. And that is the church is the cornerstone. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And the church, the scripture tells us that we are to be the salt of the earth. Um, and, uh, you know, that means we need to mix in and we need to flavor the world. And in this case, we want to flavor the world with good health. We are to be a light. You know, you know, the Bible says nobody took a light and hid it under a bushel. Um, the light has to shine. And so, you know, this is a great work and it's the work mm-hmm. of improving the health uh, of our people and the spiritual power that comes from having the clarity of mind mm-hmm. of being healthier and not having to worry about disease. So, We'll continue to, you know, to fight this good fight uh, because it is a fight of faith. Absolutely. Absolutely. Together we stand. Amen. All right. (laughs) All right. Thank you all for joining us. We will catch you next time. This is going to be our last broadcast for this year. We look forward to seeing you next year. And we have ended it with a blast with Dr. Seal. We thank you so much for your experience, your wisdom, and appreciative of you. Thanks again. All, All right. right. Bye-bye now. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. All right.